Hey, welcome Extra Historians to Lies, where we talk about all the things that we got wrong, glossed over, and didn't talk about that we should have, uh, and just didn't have room for, in our series on the Kingdom of Majapahit. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to direct you to our one-off last week on Julie Dobney. It was a great episode. Uh, Jack wrote it, Nick did fantastic art. We're going to try a new thing where we do uh, main series, we're going to put in a one-off, and then we're going to do lies, because that way I can actually see your reaction to the final episode before I tape this. And that way I don't have to try and anticipate your questions or uh, comments or corrections. So, like that, don't like that, tell us in the comments. I think it's probably going to be a good thing. Uh, I was really excited for these episodes uh, on Majapahit, but also a little bit intimidated. I was excited because I had just gotten back from Java, just out of happenstance, and I had had a great time, and suddenly I was writing about this place I had just been, uh, seeing Brabador and Prambanan, and uh, watching a bunch of Javanese shadow puppets. Wonderful place. Please go if you get the chance. It has less famous ruins than those at Siem Reap, but just as impressive and amazing. And all of you who are watching from Indonesia, I thank you for tuning in, first of all. I really hope all of you were okay. We were very worried about uh, the earthquakes and tsunamis. We wanted to help in any way we could. Uh, if you haven't given uh, yet, and you can, uh, we have two links to, to relief efforts. Uh, so la yeah, let's get started. First of all, our recommended reading for this week is George Kues's The Indianized States of Southeast Asia, published by my alma mater, the University of Hawaii. This is probably the best blow-by-blow -blow you're going to get in English of the Kingdom of Majapahit. It's built kind of like a chronicle, so just what happens and then what happens after that. It actually covers a lot of maritime Southeast Asia, all the places that were Indian-influenced. Just one thing, he was very into this idea that India had come in and imposed their culture on Southeast Asia. These days, that's not considered very likely, uh, that it was probably adopted through trade networks like we showed uh, in our episodes. Uh, so just, it's still a great book. Just kind of read it with that in the back of your mind. Uh, mispronunciations, we had a few again. A lot of them involved pronouncing V as V rather than V as a W, Sri Vijaya rather than Sri Vijaya, like Radhan Vijaya, right? Sri Vijaya. Uh, so one thing that the biggest one is we kind of went back and forth on the pronunciation of Jago. Uh, we settled on Yago, which is totally incorrect. Should be Jago. Sorry about that. Uh, the one we did purposely is that... Uh, Java should really be pronounced Java, but it's more familiar in English as Java. Also, I didn't want a bunch of Java Star Wars jokes in the comments, so we went with Java. Uh, so, episode one. The one that's going to just bother me in uh, this series until I am dead and in the ground is that I said the Polynesians were the ancestors of the Austronesians. They are the descendants of the Austronesians. And as someone born and raised in Hawaii, I should have noticed that. It drives me nuts that I just, for whatever reason, did not recognize that I'd used the wrong word. Uh, we also did a not quite correct size comparison between Indonesia and Europe. We said that tip to tip, uh, the nation of Indonesia is about the distance between London and Istanbul, it's actually London and Dubai, even larger. Uh, we put Sunda on some of the maps uh, early in the series. As we discussed in episode four, Majapahit never managed to own Sunda. Um, however, a lot of the maps are about Majapahit are a little bit speculative, so just in general, be a little bit critical of uh, the maps in this series when you look at them. Uh, they have some speculative elements in them. Uh, we didn't really get very deeply into the Selendra dynasty that built Borobudur. A good thing to remember about them is that they actually were in control of Sriwijaya uh, for a while as well. So these uh, kingdoms are not necessarily static, right? One may be the vassal of another for a while. Uh, one king may be in charge of two kingdoms. We'll talk about that a little later with Damak. Uh, a lot of them are intermarrying and the royal families are related to each other. So just something to keep in mind. 
Let's talk about episode two. Uh, Wijaya's ancestor, the original Jago we talked about, Kenarok, uh, there's one very famous story about him that we're going to just blaze through a little bit quickly. Uh, so he once saw the queen while bathing, decided that he wanted to be the king and have the queen be his wife. So he decided to murder the king. So he went to a smith and had him make a special uh, magic dagger with all these religious rituals that was powerful enough to kill the king. Got in an argument with the smith about how long it was taking to make the dagger, took the dagger and stabbed the smith to death with it. The smith cursed the dagger uh, to kill Kenarok and seven generations of his descendants. Uh, so Kenarok goes on with his plan, now with the slightly incomplete magic dagger, uh, gives it to a court official that he knows likes shiny stuff and is going to show it off all around town. Then, one night, while the court official is sleeping, he sneaks in, steals the dagger, stabs the king to death with it, and leaves it at the murder scene, so everyone thinks the court official is the one who killed the king. He then kills the court official, becomes the king, and marries the queen. So, Kenarok, original Jago. Uh, the last king of Singasari, Kirtanagara, we didn't name him in the series, but that is his name, uh, is a really interesting guy because there are two separate records uh, of his life, and one says he was basically a drunk who was very irresponsible, and another said he was a very serious practitioner of Tantric Buddhism. We went with the latter in the series because I found that case more convincing, but the reason that there's this split is that tantric practices often involved uh, imbibing large amounts of alcohol and spices and uh, intoxicants and also some sexual practices. We didn't show that in the episode partially because we want our stuff to be shown in schools and we don't want to make it uh, less likely to have that happen. Also, at just like as, as a guy who majored in religion, I find that particularly Westerners, tend to react to uh, that form of Tantric Buddhism in a way that's uh, not necessarily odd, but people assume that these are not uh, serious religious practices, that it's just an excuse to behave badly. I believe that in the Middle Ages, people were, uh, were doing this, pursuing this in a serious way. Uh, it was kind of about indulging while keeping a spiritual center. Um, and trying to keep moderate soul-wise, even if you were being uh, uh, sort of extreme in body. Uh, so it was a meditation technique. We didn't want to show that, though. But that's what's going on there. Uh, the Mongol expedition. So those Mongol generals did get punished. Part of their decision-making and leaving was that the trade winds were going to change and they were, weren't going to be able to get out for another several months if they didn't leave right then. Uh, if you were confused by our joke about the Mission Accomplished banner, sorry, it's kind of an old joke and it's a very American joke. Basically, right after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, the president at the time, George W. Bush, got in an aircraft carrier with a big banner that said Mission Accomplished, and it became a joke because obviously... The United States is still in Iraq 15 years later. Uh, so that's sort of what we were playing off. The idea that you're declaring political victory, but everyone can tell this was actually a defeat, or at least the victory is not complete. Uh, we mixed up East and West. We said uh, Bali was west of Java and that uh, Sumatra was to the east of Java. It's the other way around. Let's talk about episode three and sibling polygamy. The story is that Radhan Vijaya married all the daughters, all four daughters of Krittanagara. I read this as an after the fact uh, imposition on the record or folklore to explain why there were no other legitimate successors uh, to the final king of Singasari. It absolutely could have been uh, true uh, because that is a thing that people people did. Uh, just try and lock down all of the possible um, routes of succession so they don't have a nephew who's suddenly deciding he wants to be king. I think it was probably more metaphorical in that he did marry at least one daughter and secured his power base by marrying a bunch of uh, women who were from vassal states. 
I sort of talked around that a little bit. It could have been it could have been literal. Uh, so yeah, it's utterly possible. Uh, royal names, we didn't use them. Uh, if you want to see Janagara's royal name, it is below. That's why I didn't want Matt to have to say that. Thank you. So there you go. Uh, let's talk about the assassination of Janagara. There are a bunch of different versions of this. Uh, one is that he was poisoned. Another is that the surgeon was actually one of the rebels, but he was kept on in his post because he was too uh, important, essentially, to the health of the king. Uh, there's also a story kind of about a, a love triangle, that the surgeon was in love with one of Janagar's sisters that he had locked away. We went with the pretty straightforward one. There's also a theory that Janagar was sterile, that he was not providing an heir, and that's why Gajamata essentially instituted a palace coup to get him out of the way, because nobody really liked him all that much anyway because of his lineage, uh, because he was just not that great a king, and also he wasn't providing an heir. So for the good of the, the, the state, he essentially brushed him aside. Um, now, let's talk about Gajamata's Oath of Palapa. So this is his oath to not taste spice until all of the Indonesian archipelago is under Majapahit's rule. It's actually a very specific group of islands he mentions, Bali, the Spice Islands, uh, Sumatra. But there are a few different versions of exactly what this meant. Nobody is totally sure what it meant. It could have been literal. I won't put spice in my food until this is done. Which, if you've ever had Javanese cuisine, that would be an enormous sacrifice because it's very spicy and delicious as a result. They have a stuff called sambal, which is kind of like, this is not the best way to describe it, but if you can imagine kind of like Mexican salsa, but with more sort of Asian, Southeast Asian ingredients, and there being 20 varieties of it, it's so good. Uh, so that would be a big sacrifice just in and of itself. Another one is that he wouldn't take part in the spice of life, that he wouldn't get married, uh, live a life of wealth, that he would basically be an ascetic. Also totally possible. I think that this was a reference to court rituals that involved the consumption of spice, both tantric religious rituals and just civil court rituals that were very popular in China at the time. And as we've seen uh, with uh, Kirtanagara and his uh, tantric beliefs, there were a lot of cues being taken from the imperial court uh, in China at this time. So I think it was that. I found that convincing, but it could completely be something else. Episode 4, The Battle of Bubat. We gave the wrong year. We said 1351, it's 1357. 1351 was the year that the war started between Majapahit and Sunda that was over this marriage match that then was supposed to happen in 1357 and instead Gajabata killed everyone in the wedding party. Consequences of the Battle of Bubat. There is still a belief uh, that a man from Java, from East Java, and a woman from Sunda should not marry because their marriage will end unhappily, specifically because of this event. In fact, this year, 2018, uh, the governors of East and West Java got together in a ceremony of reconcil reconciliation about the Battle of Bubat. So this is still kind of an open wound between two very large ethnic groups in Indonesia. Uh, and by the way, during this ceremony, they put a bunch of roads in Surabaya that connect that are all named for uh, Sundanese uh, rulers and Majapahit rulers because it had become a big thing that there were no Majapahit street names in Sunda and no Sundanese street names in uh, central Java. Uh, I also want to point out my favorite thing in this whole series is Hayamuruk's chariot pulled by dogs and leopards. In the record they actually say lions. Probably that's not true. Probably they were leopards brought over from India. We don't think that Asiatic lions were, were used that way. And part of it is because there's a lot of confusion in Southeast Asia, East Asia, about lions, because there are no lions there. Uh, so frequently anything that's a big cat from abroad gets called a lion. And if you've ever seen like what a Chinese lion looks like, uh, 
they were sort of things that people knew about, but they hadn't directly seen. So there were these very artistic interpretations of them. Um, so why I love this so much, and I would think like, eh, yeah, I don't know if that's actually true. I think that's legendary, except it has this little quoted section, which is spectacular about this chariot. There's a problem with this chariot. These two types of animals do not mix together, and it takes a great number of servants to keep them in their places, and all people look at them in great astonishment. So you just imagine this, like, chariot train of dogs and leopards who are, like, snarling and biting at each other, and they're trying to get them to go the same direction. I don't know. I, I think if they didn't actually try this, we would probably not have an amazing description like that. Episode 5, real fast. We didn't use the old name of Singapore. We used the modern name of Singapore just so we didn't have to explain. Uh, there's also this other name for Singapore, Tamasek, that had mostly fallen out of favor by the 14th century. Uh, we said Paramiswara fled south after destruction of Singapore, and a lot of people point out, well, Malacca is north of Singapore. We edited some stuff out. Uh, he fled south, he did a bunch of stuff, he went back up north to found Malacca. Uh, how did Ibn Battuta like and behave in Indonesia? He liked it a lot and behaved pretty well. Uh, he liked uh, Samudra Pasai a pretty good amount. He thought that the, the king was a, a, an observant Muslim in his own way. You know, in Mali, when it gets to that point, that was his last trip. He was kind of old and cranky uh, as part of it. He was, I think, like a little more open at this time in his life. Uh, I would love to do an Ibn Battuta series. I think that guy is fascinating and, and interesting and often really funny. Uh, he's always getting himself into trouble because he's kind of a jerk sometimes. Um, okay, let's talk about the Sultan of Damak and uh, taking over Majapahit. We said that they came over and kind of like wiped Majapahit off the map and burned a bunch of the documents. We're going to pro problematize that a little bit. The Sultan of Damak probably saw himself as saving Majapahit and carrying forward uh, the legacy of Majapahit because he was related to the royal family of Majapahit and probably had as good a claim to the throne as the other people that were fighting over it during the Civil War. And uh, so in, in Damak, they often will push against this idea of the destruction of Majapahit, that no, it's just sort of like a new group of rulers uh, that are carrying forward the legacy. And there probably was some document destruction, but to me, this wasn't like a, a culture war kind of thing of trying to destroy uh, Majapahit culture. It's probably what's very common uh, in this period of time all over the world, which is when you conquer a place, you'll go and destroy a bunch of the legal records, particularly like who owns what land, because you sort of want to start from zero and parcel things out among your supporters and not have someone popping up with a deed or... Uh, some kind of royal chronicle saying, hey, this land was given to my ancestors in XYZ year. Uh, a lot of people did this. Christians did it in Europe to other Christians. Uh, the Vikings in Northumbria, they take over the north of England, and the first thing they do is they torch all the land records. I don't think that this was like a religious cultural war thing. Uh, also, probably a bunch of the documents that got left, uh, they're just decayed. It's very difficult to preserve uh, leaf documents and paper documents in the tropics. If we don't run our dehumidifiers 24-7 in Hong Kong at certain times a year, I'll come back and the papers on my desk are starting to kind of get floppy and turn to mush. It's just very difficult, unless you're actively caring for a document, to have it uh, keep going, which is why the two big ones that were evacuated to Bali are really the ones that we have. It's possible there was a lot of writing during this period, and we know there was a lot of writing, and it probably just all rotted away because of the climate. So, all right, that's Majapahit. It's in the books. So, what's coming up next? Well, first, let me just say thank you to our patrons for choosing such a really interesting series. If you would like to be a patron, uh, a link to our Patreon is in the description. You can get episodes a couple of days early, uh, monthly Q&A live streams uh, with me and other extra history and extra mythology uh, people are artists, our excellent artist, Ali, uh, who did this series. You can also vote on and suggest topics. So, what's coming up next? We got three coming up that we want to let you know about. 
Next week, we're going to start the Viking expansion. We're going to watch the Northmen raid, trade, and settle lands as diverse as northern Canada to Baghdad. Yeah. We're going to see Vikings in Constantinople fighting Imperial troops. It's going to be fun. Uh, after that, we're going to enter a shadowy world of revolutionary societies, secret agents, assassinations with Sun Yat-sen and the 1911 revolution. Very interesting. And I'll get to tell you about how the Chinese Revolution started in Hawaii. Yeah, really. So, finally, we're going to look at one of Europe's greatest agricultural disasters, the Irish Potato Famine. Probably uh, how some of your ancestors ended up in the United States. All right, so finally, Walpole. How does the Kingdom of Majapahit, medieval Indonesian, spice, thassilocracy, connect to Robert Walpole, first Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So in 1511, not long after our series ends, the Portuguese capture Malacca. They start making tons of profits. The Dutch say, hey, we want some of that too. The Dutch East India Company goes into Indonesia, starts uh, trading spice, generally being quite nasty, uh, eventually colonizing the place. And uh, who looks at them and says, hey, that's a really good idea? Well, Queen Elizabeth of England and she creates what will become the Honorable East India Company. And it makes such profits in India that who decides that they're going to create something for the South Sea? Well, Robert Harley, John Blunt, and the South Sea Company. And we all know how that ends with Robert Walpole. So there you go. Medieval Indonesia to Robert Walpole. Thanks so much for your time and uh, for watching. Tune in next week for Viking Expansion. Check out our Patreon for extra mythology. We're launching, launching a new show. Uh, the first few episodes, are the art is just fantastic. I love it. And yeah, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Stop, don't leave yet. Okay, we forgot one. So we said that Indonesian independence happened in 1949. Actually, the independence was declared in 1945. There was a four-year conflict with the Dutch, and they recognized independence and transferred the government over in 1949. So there you go.